Hey everyone, um, welcome to today's webinar. I'm Emily Marsh from the Greater Concord Chamber of Commerce, um, and I'm excited that you can join us today for the third session in our webinar series with Riverbend Community Mental Health. Um, so before we start things off, I just wanna thank um, Riverbend and Karen Jansen, our presenter today, um, for sharing you know, these great sessions with us. If you've missed a past one, you can actually go to our website conquerednhchamber.com and watch a video recording of our last two sessions. We're also recording today's, um, today's webinar, so we'll send that to you afterwards. Um, you can review it, share it with friends, and watch it later. But the cool part about being here live today, as you are right now, is um, that you can submit questions through our Q&A portal. So I'm gonna explain how you can do that. Um, if you move your mouse or tap your screen a little bit, you'll see a button called Q&A pop up. Um, click on it and then you can simply type in your question or comment. Those are only seen by me and our presenter today. So um, none of the other attendees can see what you write. Um, so feel free to share you know, questions and comments knowing that it will you know, be anonymous um, to everyone else attending today. We would love to hear your comments throughout it. We may answer questions you know, partway through if it's appropriate with the, you know, the topic that we're on, or um, we may answer them later on you know, near the end. So submit them as you think of them, um, but also submit at the end because we will answer more questions. So again, to get to Q&A, one more time, move your mouse or tap your screen, click on Q&A and type your question. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Karen. Um, thank you so much for your presentation today, Karen. Thank you, Emily. And it's great to have everybody here and be with you again. So um, I'm Karen Jansen and I've been at Riverbend for about six and a half years. And today our topic is on creating a culture of wellness. And this is a topic that is uh, very near and dear to my heart and I hope that we have a great conversation and that we learn lots as we go on. So I just want to do a quick recap um, from the other two sessions about the statistics of mental health and addiction in the workplace. You know, one in five Americans has a mental illness and then one in 10 of your full-time employees has an addiction. And as we talked about in last week's session, stigma around mental health and addiction keeps people from seeking treatment. So the more we can have these conversations, the more we can have um, a kinder, gentle workplace, the more likely are that people are going to uh, seek treatment. So what's a culture of wellness? And I thought we'd just start off with a working definition. Let's define wellness itself as a state of good mental, emotional, and physical health. And then when we talk about the culture of wellness, we think of it as an ethos which fosters a workplace that encourages and promotes the well being of your employees. And the term ethos, we don't really use it that much um, these days, but it refers to the ideas, the customs, the beliefs, the values that guide your workforce. And they're implemented very specifically within your company or your organization. So why is it important that we have a culture of wellness? Well, Mental Health America um, conducted a survey in both 2017 and 2019, and they were trying to gauge um, the quote unquote mental health well being of the workforce itself and how, um, in simpler terms, how happy were, were people in their place of um, employment. Statistics were pretty staggering. Less than a third of Americans are happy with their work. So that means 
more than two thirds are really unhappy with it, their um, current employment situation. 18% are then unhappy in their current position. So they may like the company or the organization they're working for, but they don't like their current, um, the current place that they are within that company. Or conversely, they could really like their position, but not within the companies that they're working for. So, Half of the workforce is completely checked out. And then 70% of the workforce is searching for other jobs. So if your workforce is one of your most precious assets that you have, you know, think of where you would be if you didn't have your workforce, not having them being really super excited when they come and walk through your door or even now in the remote working environment, this isn't really good for an organization's bottom line. So what happens to the individual person when there isn't a culture of wellness? One of the things you're gonna um, more likely to see is significant be behavior change. You know, people are constantly tired. They're not sleeping enough. You'll see people who were decline um, in self-confidence and you know motivation i can't do this this is too hard the, the self-defeating attitudes and then you can end up quite a bit with some unhealthy coping mechanisms drinking drug use lashing out at others you know, remember those stats, less than a third of Americans are happy with their work, 18% are unhappy with their current position, and half of that workforce is completely checked out, and 70% of the workforce is searching for other jobs. And you'll also see this with an increase in absenteeism and um, presenteeism. So what's the difference if you have a culture of wellness? You basically have very engaged employees. Your employees are gonna be committed to your organizational goals. They're motivated to complete tasks. They're confident in their performance. They demonstrate pride in the organization, you know, their willingness to recommend others to come and work there. There's a job opening, you say, hey, come work here. This is a great um, place to work. The other thing that you'll end up seeing is that they're more apt to accept workplace responsibilities. And that's the responsibilities that are slightly above and beyond um, what might be in their uh, job description. And let's see, there's a question here. Can you repeat the organization that completed the survey? I can, it's called Mental Health in America. Great organization and a great resource. Okay, so we want a culture of wellness. We want happy employees. We want people to work to their highest potential but this just doesn't happen and to create this culture of wellness we have to be talking about taking deliberate intentional um, steps in order to get to get there and it just doesn't happen overnight it's something that you kind of have to work towards and with this intent, it's composed of policies, ideas, you have to look at the customs that you have in your workplace, your beliefs, your values, all the things that guide the workforce and they need to be implemented very specifically to your organization. Okay. So let's look at what the formal side, your business practices, 
and your policies. Structurally and organizationally, your business practices and policies, they need to state and convey, hey, we value your work. We care about you as an individual. So the first place that we look to is your mission, your vision, and your values. And this is a slightly easier in a nonprofit setting because um, nonprofits are automatically charged to do um, something for the public good. So uh, our mission statements tend to be a little bit um, mushier or geared towards um, a culture of wellness, but there's plenty of businesses whose mission statements are um, configured that way too. So I'm gonna just give you um, a few examples and I'm gonna use Riverbend as my case study throughout all this. And so an example is from us, our mission statement is we care for the mental health of our community. Actually, we care for the behavioral health of our community um, because we think of behavioral health as mental health and addiction. Now, we don't think of our community as just our clients. We think of our community as the people that we employ, that we're all one big community in this together. Our vision statement also, um, has multiple components to it, but one of them that really speaks to this idea of a culture of wellness is that we are fiscally prudent and work to ensure that the necessary resources are available to support our work now and in the future. Okay, that sounds like a regular business practice, but we know that we have to have resources in order to engage our workforce and to keep our workforce with us. Um, our value statements. We value diversity and see it as essential to our success. success. We value staff and their outstanding commitment and compassion for those that we serve. Another place in your, um, on the formal side would be your strategic plan. And um, oftentimes when we write strategic plans, we're really kind of focused on where we wanna take the business and we think about organizational improvement and growth. But again, where would we be without our workforce? And over the last couple of um, two strategic plans that we've done here at Riverbend, we've really um, focused in on our workforce as an essential resource. And so five years ago, we talked about um, taking care of our employees and it was kind of a bullet point under um, our resource management right alongside our keeping up with our facilities. But this past year when we redid our strategic plan, we actually really um, took a deeper dive onto our workforce and we have five foundational pillars and workforce inv investment was one of the leading pillars. And under that, we, we stated, you know, we will improve the employment experience. And we will do that by ensuring our compensation, our wages and our benefits, is competitive in the marketplace, investing in skills training and providing opportunities for career advancement. And um, for us, this was very important, was improving mobile technology to support our community-based services. Compensation and benefits. This is a really other important thing that you need to look at and be cognizant of. You know, people want to be paid a living wage. And we here at Riverbend, you know, we've made a commitment that we were going to be a fair 15 employer. And that essentially says that 
anybody who en comes here for an hourly rate will get paid no less than $15 an hour. It's something that we have, over time, we've really moved the needle on and it's something we're very, very proud of. Benefits. It's more, benefits are more than just health, dental, vision, short-term, long-term disability. One of the key benefits, and it is so prevalent now in this COVID-19 environment, is flexibility. Can I work remotely? Do I have to work the prescribed hours? How else can I get um, my job done? Um, I think I personally really recently moved to a four day work week, four 10 hour days rather than five eight hour days. It works better for me and for my family. So being flexible, looking at the individual and seeing how um, that can play into it. And next week, the session um, is going to be on when to get HR involved. And there's a whole host of preventative measures that can be done from an HR standpoint. So um, I'm sure that a if any questions you have from an HR related um, piece, if you can just hold on to those. Um, I'm not an expert in that area. And our VP of HR, Jamie Corman, will be with you all next week. Communication. The key to communication is transparency. We've, um, we've heard it said over and over that there's 13 ways to share your message. And haven't quite figured out what all 13 ways are. Sometimes I think it's a combination of it's written, I've said it, I'm looking at you in the eye, I've now going to personally hand it to you. But um, there's a think of email, picking up the phone, walking into somebody's office. You know, how do you get your message out? And the other key to communication is that you have to remember that everything that's done internally will become external. So we utilize a wide variety. You have, as I said, you know, there's the written word, there's emails, there's picking up the phone, but how do you communicate to your and broadcast to your larger audience? All staff emails, meetings, employee newsletters, your website. Um, your staff will utilize your website and what your, web, your website communicates a whole lot about who you are as an employer, not just to people seeking your services, but to those staff who are working there. We also, a couple of years ago, implemented an intranet. I realize that if you have a small office, that's probably not something that um, makes sense for you, but we have over um, almost 400 employees, and the number one thing that people wanted on the intranet was a pictorial staff directory. They wanted to know who the people that they were talking to or emailing to look like. Um, the most important communication though is your employee to your supervisor. And it's, you need to be very intentional that the employee comes first in this. So as you're assessing performance and you're talking, them, uh, talking to them about what's going on is to really look at them and, and have them feel valued as a person that, and not make them feel like they're just another widget. The other th thing that's really important with communication is that it, you know, communication isn't a one-way street. You've got to be willing to accept feedback and you need to be able to accept it on an organizational well level as well as a personal level. So our interim CEO had a wonderful saying, 
um, that communication is top down, bottom up, and side to side or laterally. And so do you have mechanisms in place to support and review and discuss staff feedback? And then once you get the feedback, either through um, surveys or um, maybe suggestion box, however you collect data to see um, if your, how your staff is doing, taking the temperature, taking the pulse, um, you need to report that back to staff. So I'll give you an example. Um, before COVID hit, we would hold twice a year town halls and we'd bring all our staff together. And they ranged from um, workshops to staff presentations to um, keynote speakers. And after every single town hall, we'd send out a survey and we would get the feedback, not just on that town hall, but if there was a very specific topic that we knew we needed to address. So for example, the flexibility and the work hours was something that we took a pulse on our staff. How important is flexibility to you? How do you define it? Um, another survey revealed uh, our technology deficiencies. And so when we reported back to staff, we said, hey, you know what? We've heard you. We're going to reprioritize this and address this issue now, rather than six months down the road when we had it planned. And the last thing you can do on the formal side for your business practices and policies is there certifications that you as an organization can receive. Um, the, I think the most common one that we've heard about in the state of New Hampshire is um, the Recovery Friendly Workplace, the initiative of Governor Sununu, and that's around addiction and treatment. And then Mental Health in America has just come out with their own certification and it's called the Bell Seal for Workplace Mental Health. And it's actually something that we are looking towards um, exploring as uh, an organization. So that's the more formal side of the um, of what you need to do organizationally and structurally to create this and if you can tell because that's a structure that's a that is very deliberate very intentional it's designed kind of at the top top level um, of your staff with your leadership and your board of directors if um, but the fun side is um, something that I get to partake in and I personally really enjoy. So the wellness committee. And sometimes when um, we think of the wellness committee or as physical health, and it may be like, we've got to worry about um, our, all this, well, this would be slightly outdated, but if we have a lot of staff that is smoking, do we want to, um, or um, we seem to have a lot of staff who um, maybe need nutritional or uh, physical and fitness and all that. And that's all great. And our wellness committee works on that too. But our formal charge is to promote behavioral health, awareness and education, promote self-care activities, and to work on creating a community and a sense of belonging. And we'll get into um, these three charges and I'll give you some examples of how we handle it here and um, hopefully give you some uh, good ideas of what you can take back that are lots of fun and engaging. One of the things is the composition of your wellness committee. It can't be your leadership team. And 
I, I have a term that I use, um, it's, it's called a command performance. So that if it's all supervisors or people at the top, then staff feel obligated that they have to do, do that. They, it, and that they, they have to engage. And that's not the intent. You want to get to somebody's root core being that it's like, yeah, I really, really want to do that. So we look at our wellness committee as um, someplace where we need to have a lot of different perspectives. So there's people from all across the agency in all different departments and that people at all different stages in their career. So we can get a really good diverse representation of the organization. And another way to think about it is as a form of leadership development and empowerment amongst your staff. Another key integral piece is that you have to budget for this. And nobody wants to think that you have to, but you do. There are, um, sometimes you need to purchase materials. Sometimes um, there's just activities that have a small price tag to them. Uh, it's just the practical side of implementing a program like this. You can't ask your staff to be paying for this um, out of their pocket. And I think another key to this is you've got to allocate work hours. You have to think of this committee just like any other standing committee that you have in your organization. This is not an after hours group of volunteers. These are your staff. And you need to send the message very loud and clearly that we value you. We we respect your time. This is important to us as an organization, and we think it's important to you. Okay, so the first charge of our committee, behavioral health awareness and education. So, if I'm just starting off with a wellness committee and I want to promote behavioral health awareness and education, first thing that comes to mind to me is knowing the five signs. This was Justice um, John Broderick's work through Change Direction New Hampshire. He's still going out around the state and talking about um, the five signs, knowing the five signs, working to reduce stigma around mental health. And your five signs are uh, from left to right, not feeling like yourself, agitation, withdrawn, neglecting yourself, poor self-care, and then hopelessness. So this is a really easy, um, low level kind of public health campaign. You can just hang posters up around your organization. We have rack cards um, that I'm more than happy to, if people want to get involved with this campaign, I have all the supplies here at Riverbend. I'm more than happy to share them with you. Um, we, for the uh, Five Signs Rack Cards, we have them in all our new employee orientations. We have them all around um, all our buildings. Uh, it's, a, it's a great campaign and it's very, it's very, very simple and it's a good way to get the conversation going. The other thing that you can do that's really um, very simple is providing um, your organization access to community resources. So on bulletin boards, you could have, uh, for instance, the doorway, how to ask, access the doorway or what your local community doorway um, is. Um, there's uh, the doorway itself, which is how people um, throughout the state can access addiction treatment services. 
they themselves have a whole public health campaign. Um, you can have a reference guide to the, uh, your local community mental health centers. Um, the New Hampshire Behavioral Health Association is the uh, overarching organization for all 10 community mental health centers throughout the state of New Hampshire. We all have a designated region. You can just have something very simple um, posted from them that will show people where their community uh, mental health center is. Those are two really, really easy steps that you can take um, to show people how to access mental health services and injection treatment. And then if you're feeling really savvy and you really wanna get more involved, you can host a mental health first aid class. So mental health first aid is, it's just gone into the virtual environment and our instructors have just um, become certified in this. So we're very excited about that. But it teaches you how to identify, understand, and respond to the signs of mental illness and substance use disorders. It gives you the training, um, gives you the skills needed to reach out and provide initial help and support to someone who may be developing a mental health or substance use problem or who may be experiencing a crisis. It's a very, very low cost course. And it used to be um, completely in person, eight hours of training, you get a certificate at the end when you're done. It's now moved into um, a virtual environment, 100%, or you can do it on um, a hybrid type of class. We offer, as I stated, we offer it, um, we offer it to the community. We offer it to our staff, which might sound surprising being the mental health center, um, but we have a, a good portion of our staff who are not trained therapists. And this is, um, and they encounter quite a variety of uh, situations in their day-to-day -day work, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, I would highly recommend that uh, at the minimum, people who are in supervisory roles should uh, take mental health first aid. Self-care activities. This is where it starts to really become fun and you have um, the ability to highlight wonderful things going on and encourage your staff to partake in them. So first thing is try and identify activities happening in the community you're already involved in. Um, so think about certain community activities that your organization is already involved with or partnering in with other organizations, or you might be sponsoring an event. So I always say, you know, hey, it's great that company X is sponsoring nonprofit Y, but are you promoting it internally? Are you getting your staff involved with what's going on? Are you looking, if you're a for-profit and you're sponsoring a nonprofit event, are you looking at it more for just your marketing benefits and um, those marketing opportunities? Are you thinking of it more in the terms of, this sounds like a great thing. How can I engage my staff in these activities? Another thing that's really fun to do is um, offer monthly challenges and activities. And there, there are a lot of resources out there and this is where people's creativity really comes into play. Um, so the state of New Hampshire has a lot of health and wellness challenges. 
They have um, things like walk the distance of the state where you record um, on a, a daily basis how far you walk and your goal is to be able to walk the length of the state. They have um, something known as an Arctic challenge. Um, or you can do your own. Do you uh, promote good nutrition? Do you, uh, we promote people getting out, getting up from their desk, moving around. The average mile walked takes an individual 20 minutes. So a lot of things that we've done is um, for, we've printed off these fun coloring pages and you hang them on the outside of your door. And for every 20 minutes you walk, you get to um, color in a block. Um, and you, it's really fun because staff, as, you're, as you hang them up outside your door, staff are walking by and everybody's like, ah, oh, you're slacking this time. And it just becomes this fun little challenge um, that can, you can do. Another really fun thing that we did this winter when COVID first hit and everybody went home, we thought, oh no, how could we get people to remember to take care of themselves, remember to have fun. And we designed what we called river bingo cards. And just like in regular bingo, once you, you did something, you checked it off. And if you got five in a row, that was great. You handed your card in and um, I'll get to what we do at, at, with them afterwards. But on, on the squares, we put things like, did you drink eight ounces of water? Um, I went out for a walk. I got dressed today because in the early days of COVID, that was a really big thing. Um, I am trying to think of a couple of other things. I had a nutritious meal. I wrote a letter to a friend. I called a colleague. All those things that we need to do to work on connecting with each other. And the other thing that um, has also been a really great thing that we've done around here is we call them gratitude trees. And we do them in the month of uh, December. And very simple. Each of our locations strings up um, a bunch of little twinkle lights. And then we have these little note cards that um, you write something that you're very grateful for and then we hang them on the, the string of lights. It's, it's really inspiring to see um, what people are grateful for and um, really take some time and self-reflect and share at work with other, um, with their colleagues. And the last thing, especially when you're doing these monthly challenges or these activities, you have to celebrate them. And there's, you can celebrate them by having drawings or you can have prizes, um, but one, which is always fun. But I think one of the greatest ways that we celebrate is everybody takes pictures and we send them in and we have a photo album and it's a private photo album for staff and everybody gets to see each other and what other people are doing. And especially during this time when we can't all get together and half of us are working remotely and half of us are in the office. Um, and then sometimes some of us don't quite know where we are. Um, the pictures that says, yeah, I'm still here, I'm in this and are great and they're lots and lots of fun. And that picture kind of feeds right into this next place is that you're creating community. The number one thing we know is that people want to have a sense of belonging and community and always celebrating different challenges and milestones um, helps do that. 
So the classic way that we all go about um, creating community in, is department and team building activities. This is really, as I said, this is like the classic thing that businesses and organizations, uh, they're kind of go to. We're gonna go do a ropes course as a team. Um, but you have to be really, really careful that it's not quote unquote forced fund. Um, so you have to think of what are other things that I can do that celebrates the entire team or the entire department or maybe the entire staff. Um, we, for years and years and years, our tradition here at Riverbend was to have staff days by departments. And of course, we just can't gather like we used to. So we thought, well, should we have a cookout? And we're like, well, can't really quite do that too because there's too many of us. So we did something really fun and we had the ice cream truck come to each of our locations. And we were all outside this summer in ginormous circles and felt like we were all 10 years old with um, our special treats from the ice cream truck. The other thing you can do with um, department and team building activities is that you can have contests. So we're right now in the midst with Halloween being very close, having a costume contest. So that'll be um, fun and interesting. And again, celebrating all those wonderful things through our, um, our picture account. The other way you can create community is you can have hobby and sport groups. So classics are the softball team, the soccer team, um, ski team, but not everybody's really into that. And so you have to start thinking outside of the box and think of like, well, what are some of the things that other people are really interested in? Book clubs. Book clubs are great. Um, there's nothing like a good piece of literature to get people together and to get talking. Um, another thing is, could be walking groups. So uh, is there, a, do you have a cheerleader that can say, okay, I'm going for a walk today. Who wants to join me? It starts to become habit after a while. You can put it in your calendar every Thursday. I'm going walking with my um, colleagues. Uh, we did, when COVID first started breaking out and, um, or we were all sent home, we had a yoga instructor on staff and we recorded a yoga session over Zoom. We have that posted up on our internet. It gets so many views. Um, people love it. It was fun. Um, and then some other things that we're tossing around is, can we um, reach out to staff and say, do you have a special skill that you want to share? Um, a crafting group. Are you really good at making bread? Um, or other types of cooking groups? Um, you know, think about the online classes. We've got all this technology now, might as well use it. Another great way to create community is our kudos or kudos, we call them kudos cards. So these are anonymous thanks of support from staff member to staff member. And it's, we collect these cards on a, a monthly basis. So, um, for example, maybe I got behind on a project I was working in and one of my colleagues just out of the blue stepped in and finished the project for me. I can send them a little kudos card and it um, goes anonymously. Um, all the cards get to the person's supervisor, 
So the supervisor can hand them out to the person and they get a sense of what the wonderful things their staff are doing. We give a copy of the name to our, eight, to, um, our human resources department. And then what we do is on a monthly basis is we have a random drawing of everybody that got a kudos card and they end up with a $25 gift certificate to Amazon. That's just the way how we've designed it. Um, I think the gift card is like an extra perk, but what is absolutely amazing is when you walk around to everybody's offices and you see um, they, their kudos cards proudly displayed on their bulletin bars. It's um, wonderful. And I think one of the things that we're going to, um, I don't think, I know, one of the things we're implementing this month is we've designed these new um, grateful appreciation cards in the same um, same vein, I want to say, as our staff to staff. And these are for clients to fill out, um, to give to staff, of just as a way of saying thank you for being there. So we're really excited to roll that out and see how that goes. And the next thing you can do are random acts of kindness. All of a sudden, why not send um, a box of oranges to some department and staff? It's, um, it's just, a, or can you give somebody a branded gift for doing something? And lastly, you have to celebrate, 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 celebrate. Um, the, those kudos cards is how, where I mentioned that we were celebrating um, very de deliberately with a gift. But again, I go back to um, celebrating with pictures is just an amazing thing. So I don't know if anybody has any questions, is looking for any ideas. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Yeah, thank you so much, Karen. I got a lot of really cool ideas from this. So um, for everyone watching right now, you can submit questions, comments using the Q&A portal. So move your mouse or tap your screen and you'll see Q&A and you can submit right through there. Um, I do a couple questions to kind of kick things off, Karen, um, and people can keep submitting as, you know, as we talk. So you talked about, um, especially with the, the committee that you form for these activities, making sure that the work is done during work hours. Can you talk about how, um, you know, do these activities happen during work hours as well? or do people invest time outside of work to connect with their colleagues? Um, what's kind of your expectation? So our committee meets once a month for an hour. Um, it, we've been up and running for a couple of years now, so we, we've kind of got a good system going and we've been able to plan out our activities um, over several months at a time. So we're always looking ahead. Um, in terms of the activities themselves, a lot of them we do during work hours when people need to take a break. Um, but there's a lot that happen after hours too. And, you know, I, I'm, we did a book club and we did that over lunch. So we were all, everybody was taking a break. It was lunchtime. Technically, it was work hours, but people gave up their lunch hour for us all to watch each other eat a sandwich and talk about the book. Um, so, you know, our walking groups sometimes happen, but then the soccer teams end up happening at night. So it, it's kind of all over the place as to, as to what they do. But we try really hard to have nice, planful activities that are visible that you can do during the workday with people you might not typically engage with. I can see we got a, a comment in just a minute ago. Um, someone leaving some, some great thank yous and saying, uh, we're going through department separation right now. So we were trying to find ways to unite the departments. Um, 
and that this, you know, has been some great tips. So great to hear. Um, keep, you know, sending comments to, to add to the discussion. Um, I, I have another question for you. So I'm actually, um, I'm not very familiar with the five signs campaign. I want to mm -hmm. look into that more, but how um, does that um, encourage conversation and education with, with your staff? Do they, you know, learn a bit about the signs and how to interact with each other? Or is it more to encourage people to speak up if they aren't feeling well at work? Both. It's a signal that when you have the literature up and people read it and they get more comfortable looking at it and they can kind of recognize um, something they're seeing in their, their staff, their colleague or their friend, or maybe there's a self-recognition. If you as an employer have it very clear that um, we realize that this is a fact of life, we are here for you, then it's, um, the conversations start to come a little bit more readily. Um, you know, how often have you looked at a colleague and said, wow, you look really tired. Is everything okay? And they may brush it off and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're like, okay, are you sure? I'm going to check in on you again in a little bit. Um, you're kind of creating that safe environment and you're it's helping to say we're all here and we all care about each other. Does that make sense? Yeah, and we just got another question in about the Five Signs campaign. Um, where can we get more information and the actual resources for it? You can call me at Riverbend. I have, so there's a couple, I have um, thousands of rap cards. This is a big campaign that we had. Um, and I have posters that I'm more than happy just to give people. You can also learn more about it. Um, the parent organization is called Change Direction. And you can go online and they have a lot of resources there. On, um, and you can, they have things that you can download. Um, there's short video clips. There's lots and lots of resources. It's a great, um, it's, it's really good. And New Hampshire, when we launched um, the Change Direction New Hampshire, oh, I believe it was 2016, we were the first ones to do it as a statewide campaign. And um, Justice Broderick is, still is going around the state and talking and talking to people about having that conversation. It's great, it's a really good campaign. Great, good to hear. Um, kind of on that and, and with another question that was just submitted. So um, I know from experience, you know, calling Revenge and being in touch with you that it's easy to, you guys have a staff phone directory, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. So we will send a follow-up email to those who registered for today. So you can, you know, use that to be in touch with Karen afterwards if you wanna, you know, get in touch get some of those rack cards. Um, we, I have another question here. Um, will we be sharing the presentation electronically? I don't know if you're if you're up for that, Karen, but we can do that if you'd like to. I'd be happy to, Emily. Okay. Uh, I'd be happy to send the PowerPoint to you. Great, we'll do that. So um, we will email that out to everyone um, with the other information that we share. Good question. Um, we have a few more minutes. So um, I have another one from me here. So. What if your business um, and your employees' work is innately very, very stressful work? And this may, you know, be true with a lot of your staff at Riverbend. Um, it's not easy work to do what you do. And what can you do as an employer to um, kind of, in, you know, besides encouraging people taking breaks, but easing that? really severe stress a little bit? I think sometimes that's where, um, I think this is what's great about the wellness committee. Uh, I, I happen to, to sit on it because there does need to be representation from the senior leadership team on it. Um, but we get that feedback from across the agency and from 
and when we hear that then i think that's where we as the leaders of the organization really kind of step into higher gear and we support the work of the committee we promote it we engage at a much higher level than we normally would and maybe for example in my particular office maybe i'm the one that goes down the hall and say okay guys we've all been sitting here we've all been zooming it all day the doors are closed everybody's door has been closed we got to go out and get outside everybody take a 10 minute break let's go and just you've got to break you you just got to work on breaking the tension so it it's hard it, right now it's really really hard um but i think in the first couple times you you do it you might get some pushback um but the more you do it and the more encouraging you can be the rewards are so great because everybody's just the, you can just see the stress level go the tension that you could cut with a knife just kind of floats away which is really really wonderful great i don't know if we have time for one more question but maybe it's a a quick one i don't know um thinking about current times you know mm -hmm. as you said people's jobs are more stressful um, situations are really different we're not all in the same office together you know some of that is communications different if you know you can only call someone versus walk in their office and have a conversation do you have tips for both communication right now if not everyone's together like they used to be or um you know there's a lot of businesses whose employees have reduced hours or furloughed how can employers continue to show that they care um, for those employees so i think i think there's a couple ways and again it, it you know it's hard you have to be very deliberate you have to be very in, uh, and intentional in everything that you do um, we have a fun all staff newsletter that's not put together by the communications department. So, um, and it's, we've been fortunate, it's been going on for a very, very long time. It's fun. We share joys, we share sadnesses, and we share who's new on staff. So I think doing those fun things is really, really important. Um, You've got to be careful who, if you're going to do all staff communications, you really need to be careful as to who's doing it. If it's constantly coming out from the top, then it sounds like it's, um, again, the term I always use is a command performance or like, okay, here we go. I'm doing my due diligence as your CEO. When it comes from um, somewhere in the middle and you take it on and it's a little bit fun and it's um you're still getting your message out there it i think that helps and finding ways to engage so um i mean we have a lot of staff who are working remotely and so when we do our challenges we're like hey guys you know we got this new challenge going want to make sure everybody's involved i want to make sure everything's happening so it it's not it's not easy i'm not saying you know we all we're all struggling with it but um you just got to keep at it i think that's some really good insight though well um thank you so much karen what a great presentation and i'm really looking forward to next week too um i just want to share some chamber news real quickly um, with you all let me get something on screen um, just want to let you know about some upcoming events. So first up um, next week, don't miss the last session in this webinar series. Also listed are our previous sessions and you can view them on our website, conquerednhchamber.com. All video recordings, you can pause them, you can easily share them with friends, go back, rewatch, you know, segments. Um, we're also continuing our uh, webinar series with Orin Reno PA. They have been covering some really great um, topics for business owners specific about COVID especially. So our next one is about protecting your business from financial fraud. Um, again, next Tuesday in the morning. 
Um, we also have one of our virtual networking events coming up. These have been so popular. Um, people love them, so I really encourage you to try it out. Um, it is free. You can sign up whether you're a chamber member or not. Um, join us, meet some people, win a door prize. It's a lot of fun. And then coming up in November is our 15th annual Pinnacle Award Ceremony. This recognizes some really, um, you know, standout businesses, a nonprofit, a business leader in our community um, that's, you know, been really exceptional this year. You can attend online or in person, whatever you're comfortable with, um, but I encourage you to learn more about that and check it out because it's one of our, you know, biggest events of the year and we're, we're really excited about it. So, um, Again, Karen, thank you so much for the presentation. So glad we could have you today and um, look forward to our last session next week. Great, thank you, Emily. Thanks.